Okay, in that case, um, let's let's begin. So I'm very pleased to introduce Philip Henning. Um, he holds the chair of the methods of machine learning at University of Tübingen and an adjunct position at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems and received his PhD from University of Cambridge in 2011. Since that time, uh, Hennig has been interested in the connection between computation and inference. His book, Probabilistic Numerics, Computation as Machine Learning with Michael Osborne and Hans Kersting will be published by Cambridge later this year. Um, uh, Philip is also the deputy uh, deputy speaker of Cyber Valley Initiative of the state of Baden-Württemberg and a director of the program on theory, computation, and algorithms at European Laboratory on Learning and Intelligent Systems, LS. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about probabilistic numerics and computation as machine learning. So thank you, Philip. Thank you very much, Brooks, for the for the kind invitation and for the kind, kind introduction as well. Um, thank you, thank you to UCL for hosting me and to all of you both in the Zoom call and I guess on YouTube as well watching. Um, so what I like to talk to you about today is the um, something related to the the let's say sort of foundational algorithmic layer of machine learning. Um, so our field, machine learning, has become so big and so broad that I think people disagree now on what it actually is about. But I think on some very basic level, some bazaar level, we could say that it's about writing computer programs that refine models to data. Now, what actually happens on a computer when you do that, no matter what kind of model we're talking about and what kind of data, is a computation. And on, in contrast to classic, to rule-based AI, the computations in machine learning tend to be of a numerical kind. So they are not finite, but they're trying to compute a quantity that um, doesn't have a closed form expression, but which can only be approximated through repeated computations. And these are essentially all of the, the classic numerical kind of problems that we re-encounter in machine learning. They are integration problems to do probabilistic inference, to compute expected values and um, conditional distributions. There are optimization problems to fit estimators. So for example, to train deep neural networks. There are simulation problems to solve differential equations, for example, in robotics and reinforcement learning, but also kinds of scientific machine learning. And there are linear algebra as the base case of all of the above to solve, um, to solve Gaussian integration problems and quadratic optimization problems and linear differential equations. Now, when we encounter these kind of problems in machine learning, then immediately we realize that we're not the first ones to encounter them. In fact, they have been solved for us before by other kind of researchers, even often people that don't come from computer science, but maybe more from applied mathematics, from scientific computing, from computational physics. And these people have over decades, even centuries, developed algorithms, very efficient methods to solve these kind of problems. That means that for us, these algorithms arise as black boxes. They come to us as Python toolboxes, typically. And that um, like one of the things that I want to talk about today is that it may be a good idea for us in machine learning to open up those black boxes and think a little bit about what these algorithms actually do. And one thing that will turn out is that like a very first, maybe the, the most exciting news I have for you today is that you can think of these numerical algorithms actually as learning machines. Because a, um, because a numerical algorithm estimates an unknown quantity, like the value of an integral, for example, from observations of tractable quantities. Okay, I can continue. So, so my, my big reveal, my, my, my big punchline is that um, you can think of a numerical algorithm as a learning machine. Why? Because it estimates an unknown quantity, an intractable quantity, like the value of an integral, given observables, given computable, given tractable quantities, like values of the integrand at various points. And that means you can think of it as an algorithm that estimates a latent quantity given data, given observations. And that's exactly what a learning machine is. It's just that the data doesn't arise in the form we normally think of it. So we typically th think of data as some floating point numbers that are stored somewhere on a hard drive, and then they go into the compute to, from, from the outside. But in numerical algorithms, the data is actually produced on the CPU or the GPU. But it doesn't really matter, right? Where the numbers come from doesn't matter. They are the same sources of information that we can think of as data in empirical applications of machine learning. <clears throat> 
And that means we can think of numerical algorithms that solve these computational tasks not just as learning machines, but in particular also as probabilistic learning machines, as Bayesian learning machines. And then we may call them probabilistic numerical algorithms. So algorithms that don't take a discrete deterministic description of their task and then return a point estimate for the solution of the task, but which take in a probability measure over the possible task they're supposed to solve, then perform some computations on the CPU or the GPU, apply Bayes theorem to compute and potentially approximate posterior distribution, so a probability measure over the unknown quantity that they are trying to compute. So this view of computation is actually not new. It's maybe as old as other looks, other views of, uh, on, on computation. It was already discussed by people like Henri Poincaré, like in these foundational works on probabilistic inference. And it has like, re-emerged as a new topic helped by various people across the world, including UCL's FX Priol and other people, um, as a, um, a, a framework for thinking about computation, which you call probabilistic numerics. And um, it turns out that it's actually also not new in the sense that it's related to the algorithms that we already know and maybe love. Because it turns out that you can think about many classical numerical algorithms uh, in particular, the really popular ones, the ones that you know from your Python toolboxes, in this kind of language of inference. Why? Because many classic numerical algorithms for quadrature, for linear algebra, for nonlinear optimization, and for simulation, so basically for all of these domains I mentioned before, are um, least squares estimators, essentially. That's not, maybe not surprising because least squares is kind of the algorithm that's the most efficient to implement on a computer, the most low cost version of inference. So it's maybe not surprising that our low-level algorithms rely on, on least squares estimation. And if you know something about probabilistic machine learning, then you know that least squares estimates are related to Gaussian posterior estimates. And that means you can, for example, think of the estimates that arise from Gaussian quadrature rules, from conjugate gradients in linear algebra, or from quasi-Newton methods like BFGS, or from explicit single-step uh, ODE solvers like runge kutta methods as not just as point estimates, but actually also as posterior means of a Gaussian probability distribution that arises as a Bayesian posterior. So what that means, and these are relatively by now kind of old results, is that we can use these classic numerical methods as a starting point for new functionality for machine learning. So we can in particular try to inherit their speed and their robustness and their stability to build new functionality for the contemporary challenges that we face in machine learning. And I would argue that there are such computational challenges. In fact, I would somewhat um, uh, maybe contentiously argue that the classic numerical methods basically don't work in machine learning. That's for primarily for three different reasons that which I'll briefly want to highlight. One is that um, uh, machine learning models are ex of extremely high dimensionality. And by that, I don't just mean that they have many, many parameters, but that there are forces at play that convince people working in machine learning to build the model exactly to the size that it just about fits in the cache of their, of their machine or into the memory. And that means that, for example, among other things, it's very difficult to keep track of, to keep a memory of the computations, to store them. So that means, for example, things that over time try to collect data about the quantity being estimated are difficult to, imp to implement. But that's maybe not the biggest problem. Maybe the two most biggest problems are, first of all, that in machine learning, computations have stopped being deterministic, being reliable, being precise. Why? Um, because in the age of big data, so big data, the word is not just a buzzword, it actually means something. Whenever we encounter a, a function that has to be computed that depends on data, we tend to subsample our data and that produces a lot of stochasticity. So, for example, if you think of empirical risk minimization, so training, for example, a deep neural network, then you're faced with finding the minimum of some function, which happens, happens to have the property that it's typically a sum over a bunch of terms, um, where each term depends on all parameters and one datum in a big data set. But the data set is so large that when your, for example, optimizer asks you to compute the gradient of this function, you're not actually going to go through this whole sum, but instead you take a subset, a batch of the, um, the whole data set, randomly sampled, I preferably IID, 
and that gives a stochastic estimate of the quantity we're actually trying to compute. So that's maybe a good estimate actually, and of course we all do this whenever we train large-scale machine learning models. It's a good estimate also for mathematical reasons. If you sample the batch IID, then it's an unbiased estimate, and it's a sum over IID random variables, so if the batch is large enough, it's approximately Gaussian. But actually, in practice, the batch isn't large enough. The batch is typically of a size such that the standard deviation of this estimate, so the error on it, is at least comparable to, if not larger, than the quantity we're actually trying to compute. So that means the disturbance to the computation is as large, if not larger, than the actual quantity we're trying to compute. And that means classic mathematical tools, like stability analysis, um, don't really fit anymore. They, they don't really apply because they typically as assume that you're trying to compute something and then the computer um, is actually suffers from a small perturbation to it uh, due, to its due to its finite nature. But in fact, in machine learning, the perturbation is as large as the thing we're trying to compute. So in the middle of our computation, we have a likelihood showing up just from the way that the computer works. And those likelihoods are not part of the analysis and the derivation, the construction of classic numerical algorithms. A third challenge, and that's, so by the way, these, these two challenges, size and stochasticity, are maybe the reason, or at least one of the key reasons, why you don't see people using quasi-Newton methods like BFGS to train deep neural networks, but instead use these much more simplistic, if you like, first order training algorithms like SGD or Adam or variants of it. Um, not because they are inherently better, but because of these challenges. So clearly we need to, if we want to improve the performance of these algorithms, if you want to make machine learning more reliable, more useful, um, easier to use for, for non-expert users, then you need to address these kind of challenges. And thirdly, this is the bit that I want to focus on today. If you want to build a contemporary large scale compartmentalized mach machine learning solutions for complicated tasks, then we often don't just have a, an um, atomic kind of task to solve, where there's exactly one type of data and then one type of question to be asked. But instead, we tend to have now different sources of information of different nature, mechanistic, so prior kind of scientific knowledge, empirical knowledge, so real data, and then various other sources of knowledge that we can discuss in a moment that we have to combine together. But these numerical algorithms that I mentioned before that were developed in other communities, they were of course developed to solve other tasks and not necessarily to be in a modular way combined to each other. So that's, I will, I'm actually want to focus on this issue for the most of the remainder of this task. I just wanted to highlight that the probabilistic view on computation has also answers to the previous two. So um, what do I mean by this issue of multiple sources of information? For that, let me pick out um, one reduced simple example application to explain to you what I mean. Um, it's the application that is, well, up until recently at least, was on everyone's mind. We're still kind of suffering from it. What you see here is a time series of the um, a num number of infected people in Germany in the, um, during the COVID pandemic, at least for the first, well, one and a half years of it. Um, so, and I don't want this to be a political task, a, a, a talk at all. I just want to use it as an example to think about what kind of problems you may encounter in the wild. An example of a task that is evidently important for um, all sorts of various reasons. So if you get a time series like this, then we all know now that the obvious question on everyone's mind, at least in the summer of 2021, was how does this line continue into the future, right? How does it continue on the right? So if you think of this, in a, um, if I, so if I, if, I, if I could ask my, my straw man um, undergraduate machine learning student, how would you address this kind of problem? Then maybe the first answer might be, well, I use my no, no standard you know, machine learning tools to extrapolate to the right. So I could train, I don't know, a Gaussian process reg a regression uh, model or uh, you know, a simple feed forward neural network. And I guess we all agree that that's not going to work well that so these kind of methods will extrapolate on the right, maybe in a straight line, or they return to zero, or they extrapolate in some kind of simple fashion that doesn't actually reflect what we expect to happen. Why? Because we have additional mechanistic knowledge. We know that this line isn't just some stochastic process going up and down. We know that it's governed by some physical causal processes that describe, like that, that, that um, 
affect how this line is going to uh, um, de develop into the future. One way to capture such mechanistic information is through a differential equation. So a simple such differential equation is these um, by now famous SIR type models. So we, we stratify the population into groups of susceptible, infected, recovered, vaccinated, diseased people, and then write down how people move from one group to the next. So what we're plotting here on the top, the black line is I, that's the number of infected people, and the other groups we currently don't see in this plot. So people move from one to the other by getting infected, by recovering, by dying, by getting vaccinated, and so on. So um, these kind of models are what you would classically maybe uh, you know, consider as a simple simulation task. So a forward simulation problem. I give you a differential equation. I know the, um, what, what the population, where the curve starts at the beginning, and then ask how does this um, uh, trajectory of this dynamical system develop into the future. But so when I do that, then we suddenly have two problems. The first one is that in this description I just gave you of a, of a dynamical model, the data that is shown at the top of the screen doesn't play a role anymore. It's not clear how it relates to it. And uh, secondly, and related to it, um, or conversely maybe, in the differential equation that I've written down down here, there are parameters in there that are actually patently unknown. A particularly important one is this beta here, which, is the which affects the rate at which people get infected if they are susceptible um, by being in contact with infected people. This beta is called the contact rate. It basically describes how often people meet in public. And if it were constant, then this line here would just be an exponential growth initially. Now, we all know that that didn't happen because people had changed their behavior and beta went down. But how did it went down? Uh, how, how did it go down? How did it evolve over time? Um, th those are the like, obvious questions. And if you don't know beta, then you can't simulate forward. But we have this data, this black curve available. So somehow that should tell us something about beta. So this is a kind of problem where, so notice that this is not just a, a something you could call an inverse problem. So we don't actually care about knowing beta. We care about knowing the forward sol solution, i into the future. But it's somewhat kind of a, a mixture of a forward and an inverse problem. There is a source of information that is mechanistic and a source of information that is empirical. It's just data. And you want to combine them together. And there are classic ways of solving these kind of, these kind of problems. Um, they are, so this is a complicated slide, let me just summarize it very briefly. They are basically, you use one of these black box methods that come from some other community that is maybe called an ODE solver. And you maybe make, okay, let me maybe just briefly formalize a little bit what the, the, the task is here. So there's a differential equation. In this case, it's an ordinary differential equation. And that differential equation describes the dynamical behavior of some curve X. In this case, it was the number of infected people. In, in the form of some nonlinear equation that related to the derivative of this curve and some unknown, which you could call latent force. So in this case, it's this beta, this contact term. So we don't know the latent force. So what we could do is we could initialize some with some first guess for the latent force, run one of those black box solvers forward through time. That gives us one simulated curve. And then we can see how well that curve fits to our empirical data. So we can compute some loss function, like some square loss, for example, difference between the curve and the observed uh, trajectory, and then um, compute a derivative, if we're good, uh, with automatic differentiation of this loss function with respect to the latent force and follow the gradient. In fact, that's what many people do. Let me just highlight a few examples of how this is actually done in practice. So here is an, uh, in, 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 in toolboxes that I would argue are uh, of very high quality. So here's an example from NumPyRo. This is a probabilistic programming package um, that is relatively recent. It's a very high quality kind of, kind of piece of code. So I don't want to diss it at all in, in contrast. I, I actually want to say this is, this is like the state of the art of doing these kind of things. Um, here's a different, this is, a, this is from, from their tutorial on how to use the, the, the toolbox. It's a different kind of dynamical system. It's a classic kind of predator-prey kind of problem. In blue, you see um, predators, uh, numbers of predators over the years, and in gray, numbers of, uh, of uh, prey over the years. But it's basically the same problem, right? There's an unknown parameter in a, in a differential equation. So when they solve this kind of problem, they define the differential equation here. 
and then um, in this, this is a probabilistic program, so they write down the parameters that they are trying to infer as uh, in terms of probability distributions or samples from those distributions, and then call this black box method repeatedly to create samples from the unknown parameters. So this is a very typical kind of situation in in these kind of in these kind of uh, in, in whenever people encounter these kind of mixed information source problems that they have this somewhat awkward piece of code sitting in the middle that just has to solve this this simulation problem so where does this actually come from this or this ODE integrator well if you dig down how numpy actually does it's it's uh, a very high performance uh, uh, computations for simulations it uses um, an ODE solver from JAX um, so an automated differentiation library out of Google. And if you like, try to find out what this method actually does is it um, um, uses a cl classic Runge-Kutta method, the dominant prince pair, it's a, a order four and five Runge-Kutta methods. So um, you don't have to understand how these methods actually work. What I want to, like, like this, the little secret that I want to let you in on is that this piece of code actually revolves around a for loop a central for loop that predicts forward through time. Now, um, it's sometimes difficult these days to find these for loops. You have to go through this code and realize that you can't actually find fours anymore. You'll just notice that there is a check scan argument somewhere that like hides the fact that inside of this code, there is a forward pass through time. So if um, we solve this ODE here in this black box, there is a little for loop hidden inside that passes through time forward. So what we're looking at here actually is a double for loop, a nested for loop. We're fitting the latent force and we're, we're predicting the trajectory of the dynamical system forward through time. There are over different domains, these for loops maybe, but they're still nested for loops. And we know as computer scientists that nested for loops are not a good thing uh, because they are in some sense kind of quadratically expensive. So maybe at this point, let us open the black box and see what it actually does. So here is my very pedestrian look at an ODE solver. So it's another, another different kind of ODE for this picture, but they're always of the same type. So there is an equation that relates the trajectory of a dynamical system X across time um, by stating that the, the time derivative of this curve is equal to some vector field, some nonlinear function evaluated at the path of the curve. So that's an implicit equation. That's why it's hard to solve. And what we know is, so that curve is this black line here in this picture, which of course we don't know yet. So um, we're trying to figure it out. And this vector field F is these, given by these arrows in the plot. Now we know that we may know that this curve goes through some initial value. That's maybe this black dot over here. And our algorithm is supposed to find that black line. So one way to do that, that is actually not exactly identical to how the code I just showed you of a classical method does it, but it's extremely closely related to it, is to think of it as a recursive learning problem or an active learning type problem. So we initialize at this initial point, at this black dot, we know that the curve goes through there. That means we can evaluate the vector field at that point that gives us a little arrow. And we can use that to construct a prior over what the curve, the, the trajectory of this dynamical system is. We can use that to predict forward in time, to take a step forward, and then add, um, construct an estimate of what the trajectory may be at that point. And in, at this particular point, for example, at our best guess of what the trajectory may be, we can reevaluate the vector field or at various other points here as well, and use that to update the estimate and again, move forward through time and then evaluate the derivative again and keep conditioning on observations of the rate of change of this curve to up until to we reach some endpoint where we want to make a prediction and then we have an estimate of what the trajectory of this dynamical system is. So this is a recursive time series, if you like, um, observation regression prediction problem. And I can tell you that, I mean, you can maybe maybe guess from this picture that you can address it with a essentially a Gaussian process type model, um, regression algorithm that repeatedly constructs the point at where, where it may, wants to make an observation within the vector field. 
Now, it turns out that the, like, even though the way I describe this is in terms of the language of machine learning, it's actually very close to how a classic numerical algorithm works. In particular, this way, um, so if you implement it efficiently, if you implement it with a Gauss Markov type model um, of solving this kind of inference problem, inherits the mathematical properties that we classically want from uh, ODE solvers. In particular, it's linearly expensive in the number of steps. It has a high approximation order. So that means if we increase the number of steps that we allow the algorithm to take linearly, then the error, the distance between the red and the black curve, drops polynomially with a high order polynomial, like eight or nine or 11 or whatever you like, or also four or five for these Wangakuta methods. Um, but it also has a new property, which the classic methods don't care about, um, which is that there is this region of uncertainty around the thick red line, which is an estimate of the error of the algorithm. And actually, that region of uncertainty contracts at a rate that is a worst case error bound, as can be shown, for the distance between the black and the red line. So it's a meaningful notion of uncertainty that we can actually use to quantify uncertainty. So what kind of algorithms are these? Well, they are close to these black boxes that you're using somewhere um, without necessarily thinking about what they do, but they're actually also Kalman filters. So Kalman filters being like the other term for Gaussian process inference in Gauss-Markov models. So they inf involve inference in a Markov chain type graphical model of latent states, which correspond to um, at least the actual trajectory of the dynamical system and its derivative, but also maybe other states, and um, being conditioned on observations of some kind. And those observations have to be constructed for the Kalman filter. They just have to be of some kind of approximately Gaussian form. And for differential equations, those observations are called information operators. This is an idea due to Philip Tornarp. Um, which are of this form. So they encode the fact that at certain points in time, the ODE holds. So that means the derivative of the, 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 this curve we're trying to estimate is equal to the value of this nonlinear vector field F at the value of the curve X0. So um, these algorithms can be implemented very efficiently. So if you've, seen, if you've not seen a, a Kalman filter before, they are just very simple low level floating point algorithms. Um, floating point operations, so just sums and products of, uh, of floating point um, numbers. And they tend to proceed, or they proceed in a forward and backward pass along this Markov um, chain. If you only want to predict at the end, the forward pass is enough. If you want to have a dense output, the forward backward pass is uh, what you need to do. So this allows us to phrase this, in this uh, computation, this simulation task in a, the language of machine learning. By the way, these kind of algorithms are now also not just uh, academic research anymore. They are available as uh, software packages. If you go to problem.org, um, you can find a, a high quality implementation of these kind of solvers and you can maybe convince yourself that they are actually usable in practice for these kind of simulation tasks. So how would we use these for um, this kind of task that I just described before, this kind of inverse or mixed inverse forward problem, this mixed information source problem, observing the trajectory of the dynamical system, knowing that it's governed by some dynamical system with some unknown parameters and hoping to predict into the future. So instead of using a nested loop of an outer loop that, that optimizes some unknown latent force that also is a function changing through time, and an inner loop that simulates forward through time, we could actually do both at the same time using the fact that the ODE solver itself is also a filter. So returning to this uh, picture of a, of, a, of a Markov chain, if we had the entire ODE, the entire initial value problem without any unknown parameters, um, then we could do this, right? So that's the picture of what a numerical algorithm for the solution of a differential equation actually does pretty much under the hood. But we now have new source of information and that's the data. That's the fact that we know that the trajectory can go through various points in, uh, no, that it doesn't, it, not that it can go, that we know that it does go through various points across the, the time series. So we could condition this state space model on this data as well, just like, so that's basically just your, your 
uh, box standard Gaussian process regression, more or less, just with the fact that it's a Markov model as well. And we can use those, this additional information to inform the solver about parts of the dynamical model that it doesn't know. In this case, it's these latent forces, the contact rate, beta, that changes across time. So we could just add those latent forces to the state space. We say there is this latent force that also changes through time. Its behavior is also governed by some um, Gaussian process prior over what its behavior may be over time. And just hope that the ODE solver uses the information from both sources to learn both about the latent force and the trajectory that we care about in a single forward loop. Now, it turns out that that's actually possible. We had a paper last year at NeurIPS that did exactly this. This is the result from this kind of um, um, pass. So what you see here is the output of this method. On the top, you see the, traject the estimated trajectory of the dynamical system. Obviously, where there is data, we're very strongly constrained by the data. And then into the future, we get a prediction of uh, future, future development of the system. And at the bottom, you see an estimate for this latent force. So initially, we know very little. Why? Because there are no cases. So if you don't have people getting in that um, uh, are infectious, you can't use them as probes in society to detect how often people are meeting each other. Then initially, the curve kind of rose. Then we all flattened the curve. The curve came back down. That means that contact rates had to have go gone down. Then over the first summer, at least here in Germany, we have relatively low case counts. That means, again, we don't know how often people meet because they don't infect each other. Um, um, because there are so few infected people around. Then when the second and third waves hit, we again get high confidence over what the contract rate was. And into the future, of course, we become uncertain again what the de development of the system may be. Now, the main point about this plot is that it's constructed by a single forward ODE solve. So that means even though these probabilistic solvers in their current Python implementation are still a factor of 10 to 50 to 100 slower than high performance implementation of classic ODE solvers, they are actually faster for these kind of applications, significantly faster in war clock time. It's not because Bayesian inference is faster than point estimation, but because it allows you to do two things at once and get rid of one for loop, essentially one nested loop and run in a single forward pass. We can combine these kind of um, uh, sources of information with all sorts of other information as well. So just to give you another example, uh, this is a, a plot from another paper by Nathanael Bosch, one of my PhD students, um, where he kind of listed various kinds of information that you can condition the trajectory of such dynamical systems on. For example, also um, the conservation of energy. So here on the left, you see uh, in black a uh, classic kind of benchmark for OEE solvers. It's called the Heron Hylis system. It's some kind of set of um, orbits through space. And if so this is a high precision solution of this system, if you run the a solver at a much lower precision, one of our probabilistic solvers, but you could use a classic solver as well, you get this green curve. And the reason that it looks so a little bit out of shape is that this system on the left is actually energy conserving. But the ODE solver doesn't know about this. Um, but you can possibly, uh, or it's, it's not, not a problem to, in, to in, um, inform the solver about this just by adding one more information operator that just says across time, at every point in time, there is some nonlinear quantity that depends on the state of the system that's called the Hamiltonian, and the time derivative of that Hamiltonian is zero. So the energy is conserved. If you do this, then you get this plot on the right, which even though it's at lower precision, at least keeps the qualitative shape of the system. Now, there are classic ODE solvers that also are energy conserving, symplectic geometric integrators. And um, of course, they, they can do the same thing, right? They can exactly solve this kind of problem as well. But these are, again, black boxes designed for a special um, type of problem that um, cannot easily be combined with other sources of information. So if we want to build new tools for um, the kind of data rich domain that we now live in, in computer science in general and in machine learning in particular, then I believe we need new numerical algorithms that are um, reducing these numerical tasks more towards the primitives that we tend to know from other parts of machine learning. In this case, it's a 
um, well, essentially an associative scan, right? Um, forward through time with an observation operator. And um, then build them in such a way that we can combine these different sources of information together efficiently. These ODE filters, as they are called, are, in uh, my opinion, the for at least for the, the task of simulation, solving differential equations, ordinary and partial differential equations forward through time, a very interesting direction to, to take if we want to achieve this kind of modularity in our code. So, I would, could easily go on for another 20 minutes or so um, if you wanted to, but I don't think that's a good idea. Instead, I want to stop at this point. I have some more slides in case someone wants to ask questions, but I want to get into a bit of a conversation with you, which is anyway difficult over virtual formats. So let me um, first thank my research group of wonderful PhD students. Um, all of the work I showed you was work by uh, various PhD students, some of the people in this, in this picture. Um, that I really uh, enjoy working with and briefly summarize what I wanted to say. So first of all, on a very high level, you can think about computation itself, the lowest task of a learning machine as inference, as machine learning itself. So that means if you are a machine learning engineer or an expert, then you kind of have an opportunity, I wouldn't say a license, but an opportunity also to meddle with the numerical algorithms of your, of your machine using, of course, meaningful, good classic numerical algorithms as a starting point to not mess up everything. This is important because contemporary machine learning requires managing various different kinds of information from data, from mechanism, from computation, none of which are fully informative about the task we're trying to solve on their own, not even the computation, because computation and machine learning these days is very noisy. Probabilistic numerical algorithms provide a part of the answer on how to build a solution that addresses all three of those, the computational part of the answer, um, by casting computation in the same language as the other two sources of information, data and mechanism, in the probabilistic language. I showed you one example, probabilistic ODE solvers or ODE filters, which are algorithms that are very similar to classic um, numerical solvers for differential equations in terms of their algorithmic structure, in terms of their raw performance, um, but they add something to it, uh, calibrated uncertainty, and can be combined in a more modular fashion with all sorts of additional information. Right. So I think that's what I wanted to say. I, um, of course, also can't go without pointing out that there is a book coming out about this kind of work together with Mike Osborne and Hans Kersting. Um, I just got the proofs from the printer um, yesterday, so it should hopefully be, be out soon. If you're interested in our kind of work, then you can find more under all these links below. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I guess, uh, so I guess, do you want to open this up for discussion, which is obviously a little funny over Zoom, but I think if people uh, can raise their hands and sort of ask questions, then we'll kind of scroll through and make sure things come up. Um, maybe I can start by asking a question I had as you were going through this, which is, um, as you... Uh, um, as you switch to this kind of uh, linear Gaussian state space model, as your you know your, your setting you're working in, um, does this change the model at all? So, uh, I mean, um, before you had uh, for the for the for the coronavirus case counts, for example, there's a there's the ODE model and you have some data, but here now I guess there's there's a likelihood involved and this has parameters and so on. So is this is this introducing new parameters or is this is this kind of changing the the generative process in order to add stochasticity? Is this no. something we should be concerned about? So, yeah. so the simple answer is no. Um, okay. As if we're talking, if you're talking for the moment, if you, if you put, us, put aside this application, um, that specific like com combined source of uncertainty in both the ODE and the, and, and the data that, I, that I've, I've used this for, and focus for a moment on actual just solving an initial value problem. So the kind of the thing that the black box algorithms are actually made for. Then, um, what we're doing here is we're, we're so so no matter whether your algorithm is probabilistic or not probabilistic, it has to solve underneath under the hood. Um, well, it has to solve this this kind of issue, right? It has to repeatedly predict into the future and then estimate where it wants to evaluate. Or in a more mathematical language, it has to construct the nodes at which it wants to evaluate. And that doesn't isn't possible to do without an assumption about the behavior of the curve. So you need some kind of assumption. I'm just phrasing that assumption in terms of a prior rather than 
some algorithm that can then be analyzed. So this is similar to the to the like methodological connections between frequentist and Bayesian statistics in that the Bayesian writes down a generative model and the frequentist writes down an algorithm and then sometimes they actually turn out to be very similar, uh, very close to each other. Another way of thinking about this for the specific application of the differential equation is that we are modeling, that's on this slide here, we're modeling the behavior of this dynamical system, which is governed by a nonlinear ordinary differential equation. We're modeling it with a linear stochastic differential equation. That's the one that's on the slide at the moment, this one down here. And that's similar to how if you want to learn a nonlinear function in a regression task in machine learning, you may model it with a linear stochastic process, a Gaussian process, right? And so once, like, so, the, so the fact that there is a stochastic process showing up here doesn't mean that the algorithm is stochastic. It doesn't mean that we pretend the dynamical system is stochastic. It's just we use a probability measure as our prior. And in fact, as the data increases, so if the step size of the solver decreases, if the computational resources we give to the solver increase, then asymptotically this prior washes out. It doesn't matter anymore in the sense that the yeah, so the, the, the error, so the, the distance between this red line and the black line contracts as a function of the number of steps of the solver with, so let's call that number n, it contracts with n to the minus q, where q is some convergence rate, which for these solvers these days is typically 8, right? So good. And then thus, yeah, so asymptotically, the prior contracts to a point mass posterior if you really have infinite amount of computation. Yeah. That now, um, maybe while we're waiting for more questions to come in. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I guess no. I'm, I'm looking at the delta function here so the, the, on, the, on the Zs. Is that uh, Ah, yeah. yes, wonderful. So this is this idea of an information operator that is uh, due to Philip Tonarp. And it took me a while to understand as well. Um, it's, it's the way that we now typically phrase these kind of observations in this, in this framework. It's, it has turned out to be a very helpful um, um, kind of primitive, right? So we are like the, on these information operators, they encode the fact that the ODE holds. So we actually think the ODE is correct. That's why it's a delta function. However, so notice that this, this uh, term is, so it's a Dirac delta that involves the difference between X, the state space of the, of, of the, of the system evaluated at the first point. So that's, it means it's, it's derivative at the first uh, element and a non-linear function of the state. So w now it turns out that we, no, not it doesn't. Uh, so at, at this point where we make the observation, of course, we don't know what X actually is. So if you go like back, if, you, if I go back to this picture, right? So at the moment when we make the, make the prediction, this is the, the green dot here, we don't actually know what the solution is. We have a Gaussian posterior around it. So to construct our observation, we have to marginalize over those variables, right? To to um, actually condition on on, on the observation, um, and that means we get um, actually do get finite uncertainty, and that marginalization is has to be approximate because f is a nonlinear function. So we linearize it, and that's called the extended Kalman filter. So even though there is a Dirac delta here, it, that doesn't mean that there is no quote unquote observation noise in the model, it does keep track of the fact that its own predictions are uh, imprecise. Okay, thank you. So uh, I guess somebody, uh, feel free to, I guess, jump in or raise your hand on Zoom for anybody else who would like to, 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 to bring something forward. Otherwise, um, yeah. Otherwise, I'll be tempted to just add more stuff to talk about, which is probably not yeah, what, the, what the audience wants, right? <laughs> Let me go to the end of my slide again, so leave something out. Otherwise, I'm also happy to just leave it at that. Maybe I can point out that this code is available online. Um, please try out these kind of algorithms as just maybe to make it clear, 
we are not just like th this this kind of approach does not just work for differential equations it this was just an example it also applies to classic integration quadrature in the sense of Bayesian quadrature and various versions of it that now exist. Um, it applies to optimization, not just to Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization is arguably one way of using this kind of framework to think about optimization, but there are also um, ways of thinking about the more kind of traditional, fast, high dimensional optimization in this language. There, the prim primary um, challenge is to or the primary interest is to is not to improve the behavior of optimizers per se, but to make them more robust to stochasticity as we know it from deep learning, and uh, also to linear algebra as kind of the most extreme lowest level of computation. Um, linear solvers are very important all across machine learning, not just in Gaussian inference, and um, there as well data tends to be extremely large and noisy and imprecise. So um, there's also very interesting results about uh, how to think about linear algebra in terms of um, inference. OK, well, thank you very much. If there are no further questions, I, I, I know it's hard to resume. Then then um, I think, uh, I think yes. we'll all take a look at your, your implementation. And thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for coming and talking to us. Well, thanks. Thanks, Brooks. And thanks, everyone. Have a good day.